What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review of Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden after 100%. So a couple of things to get out of the way. I like to review games after 100% to set myself apart from other reviewers on YouTube and lend myself some credibility. But moreover, a review after 100% does include more things than just the achievements. If you're brand new to my channel and you click on my channel page, the first thing you'll see is a video explaining everything I cover in these reviews. But with that out of the way, Mutant Year Zero is a kind of weird game, to be honest with you. It was developed by Swedish developer The Bearded Ladies, and it is based off of a tabletop role-playing game. The story itself is going to run you probably about 10 to 15 hours, so it's not super long or anything. But the game itself is kind of this weird blend of stealth puzzle game meets tactical RPG, and it's really hard to sum up with any of like the typical genre buzzwords you might use. So we'll talk about that more at the appropriate time, but it is definitely an isometric combat focused game with stealth and RPG elements. Now, the basic story setup for the game is that you are play as one of several stalkers for the Ark. The Ark is sort of a last bastion of humanity in a place called the Zone, which is a post-apocalyptic wasteland, as you might imagine. That said, the post-apocalypse in this world was caused by a plague. So there are still quite a few living things around. They're just mutated, look pretty rough, but trees and things like that are still in abundance. But the actual story is basically that your stalkers come back from a mission. They are sent to find your civilization missing engineer who kind of helps keep all the machinery that you do have running and that kind of kicks off a chain of events that lead to the main story. Now when you first fire up the game the difficulty choices you're going to find are normal, hard or very hard and then an optional toggle called Iron Mutant. Now Iron Mutant is your standard Iron Man mode. Your save gets deleted if you die, there's only one save file kept, etc. You can toggle that with any of the other difficulties. But normal hard and very hard, while even very hard I wouldn't say is particularly difficult, it's just important you know what you're doing. Because difficulty in this game really revolves around knowing where to find your weapons, knowing which mutations on your mutant stalkers to use, and how to approach combat the way the developers intended. But we'll talk a bit more about that in the actual combat section. Now when it comes to playing the game, you're not going to create a character, you're going to play as one of five stalkers, who also happen to be mutants, and you're going to have a team of three of them at any given time. That said, outside of combat, you can freely swap them in and out of your squad as much as you want. But those mutants are Ducks, Borman, Selma, Magnus, and Pharaoh. There was one more added in the DLC, but we'll talk about that when we talk about the DLC. So each of these mutants gets a mutation tree. That is to say, as you level up, you get to spend points on mutations, which give them just different kinds of abilities, which can help you in various ways during combat. So with all of that out of the way, let's talk about world building and kind of just playing the game a little bit. Now, the game itself is very linear for the most part. You will be sent in a direction. You can't really go any other ways while you explore the environments, but you're going to explore these little handcrafted maps with handcrafted combat encounters on them. The maps themselves are fairly small, and you're going to go through a set path to each of your main story objectives. There are a couple offshoot side areas that you don't have to do, but the game kind of expects you to explore each map fully, especially on very hard, if you plan on progressing. In addition to this, you'll occasionally be heading back to the Ark. Outside of combat, you can travel to the Ark freely as much as you like, and this is where you're going to buy consumables, upgrade your gear, or turn in artifacts. Now, you can upgrade your weapons specifically by finding weapon parts throughout the world. This is a must, and you should really focus on upgrading your silent weapons first, because silent weapons allow you to kill enemies off by themselves without alerting the rest of the enemies. So it's important you focus on upgrading your silent weapon. And then in addition to this, I mentioned artifacts. So throughout the world, you can find artifacts, which are actually just like everyday household items for the most part, that in a post-apocalypse seem especially interesting to the mutants. For instance, you can find things like a toaster that they will call a hand warmer and just other sorts of humorous stuff. And that is one thing that this game does very well. It's just kind of like some tongue-in-cheek humor mixed in with all the death and decay type of stuff from the typical post-apocalypse setting. But the artifacts you can actually turn in at the arc for passive bonuses that affect a wide variety of things, such as just giving you a flat damage increase to living enemies or robots or increasing the damage of your throwables, that type of thing. That leads naturally into the combat section a bit here. So as I mentioned earlier, the game itself is sort of like this tactical puzzle RPG that is heavily based around stealth. Now the combat itself is turn-based, that's important to know. 
And while the mechanics of it are relatively simple, as they really just kind of focus on ambushing and taking out targets silently, which unfortunately leads to the reality that there is really only one correct way to play this game, especially on very hard mode, and that is to pick off enemies by themselves that have just kind of separated away from the main group. And you're going to do this through use of silent weapons, as well as abilities and things that will stun the enemy. Now, on very hard mode, when you use your abilities, they will actually not be reset after each combat encounter, like they are on, say, normal. On very hard mode, your abilities are only reset after you kill a certain amount of enemies afterwards, which is usually between two to three. And this makes the exact order you kill enemies in very important, as you'll need your abilities to be recharged. And this is going to lead to you maximizing which mutants you're using, which abilities you're using, which weapons you're using, which throwables and other things you can use to incapacitate enemies silently. All of that sort of combines into what I would argue is the correct way to take each encounter. And while lower difficulties will have some variation on this, on very hard mode that's kind of set in stone, especially with the way the game handles accuracy and damage mitigation. You can equip armor and things on your own stalkers, as well as see it on other enemies. Those kind of gray little blips next to their health bar are their armor. That is how much damage your attacks are going to get mitigated, meaning that if you see two of those blips, two of the damage from your weapon will never hit that target's health. And this is why it can be necessary to incapacitate an enemy when you know it's going to take a couple turns to outright kill them. Typically speaking, robots will have the most armor, however they are completely susceptible to EMP grenades as well as weapon mods that will allow you to potentially do EMP damage, because EMP rounds will just completely disable a robot. And then, despite how much armor it has, as long as you have enough to actually hit the thing's health, then you have the time to take out that robot. And combat for the most part, really just boils down to that, finding the right combination of all these things for each encounter. So next up, let's talk about the DLC. This game did receive one DLC called The Seed of Evil, or Seeds of Evil. Now, for the most part, this DLC doesn't do anything new per se, in the sense that much of it is the same as you would expect from the main game. The combat's the same, the approach is the same. However, you're going to see some new enemy types. You get a new mutant called Big Con. You can explore some cool new areas. You get new abilities. And it's just one of those DLCs where it's like, if you liked the main game and you want more of it, the DLC is there to provide it. In fact, you see them do a couple of different things. So throughout the main game, you'll find either EMP grenades or you'll find mods that give your weapons a chance to do EMP damage. Whereas in the DLC, you can just find a gun that just purely does EMP damage and that it'll stun robots every single time you use it. So they kind of mixed up exactly what was available, but the DLC itself is largely just more of the same. Not to say that it's not fun, mind you, as the DLC adds like probably six to eight hours roughly, if you're not rushing through it, to the overall experience, which almost doubles the length you might spend with this game. So let's talk some positives, some negatives, and wrap this thing up. The positives. The world is really cool. I really enjoyed the art direction, how they built out these maps. Throughout the game, you'll find notes and things that kind of fill you in on the lore of what happened with this plague, how it was handled, how the world reacted to it, basically. And a lot of that is really cool. And truthfully, it's the kind of thing I would like to see put to more use in a more fully fleshed out game as this honestly feels more like a double A experience for the most part. Now, for me personally, this is definitely not going to be for everybody. I really, really enjoyed the combat loop of this game. As someone who plays a lot of CRPGs and for combat and things, this straightforward tactical puzzle RPG, I got super into it. Probably more so than most people will, admittedly. But that was a big positive for me. I really enjoyed the gameplay loop. So let's talk negatives. For starters, the story is very linear and very short. And while the game has RPG elements, like building out your mutants and things which way you please. Ultimately, you're not going to be making any choices. The story is what it is. And the game is really about your approach to combat encounters than anything else. And the other negative is while I did enjoy the combat personally, there is nonetheless really only one correct way to play this game. Which is unfortunate because there's no real like variation in play style. It's basically stealth, pick off the loner enemies, disable groups of enemies altogether, and try to kill things as quickly as possible without ever taking any damage yourself. So if you're looking for anything besides that type of play, 
you're just not going to get it. So with that out of the way, let's talk a bit of a conclusion here. Frankly, the combat is make or break whether or not you like this game. It has a lot of cool elements, but the game focuses mostly on the combat, like probably 70%, I would say, is just the combat. And as such, if you don't like the combat, you're not going to like this. I personally did like the combat, so I enjoyed the game quite a bit. That said, on Steam right now, this game is sitting with its DLC at $45. That's a little much, frankly. I would buy it on sale. I believe I personally picked it up for like 10 bucks, which is a great price. So while it is a fun game that I enjoyed quite a bit, I would not recommend paying full price for this. I would wait for it to be on sale for sure. But there you go, guys. There is my review after 100% for Mutant Year Zero, Road to Eden. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. It really genuinely does help the channel anytime that kind of thing happens. Thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. Thank you.